Hey, Edith. Yeah, Christy. You know, there's nothing like a little tomato soup to soothe the soul. Oh, yeah. I like mine cold. Uh-huh. Over ice. Yum. With a celery stock. Ooh. And vodka. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Slurp. What did the pig say at the beach on a hot summer day? What? I'm baking. <laughs> I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hello, gardeners and wannabe gardeners. Hello, everybody out there, and hello, Christy, across the room. Hi, Edith. Hi. My favorite holiday is coming up, Edith. Oh, what? what is that? August 8th is what? Leave a zucchini on your neighbor's porch day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be fun, except you don't have any zucchini. <laughs> That's the sad part about it. I'm going to oh. go, you know what? I'm going to go buy zucchini and just leave it on my neighbor's porches. Oh, Christy, do you want a Kleenex, honey? Do you? <laughs> you know, in Minnesota, that's why we um, lock our cars. The only reason why we locked uh-huh. our cars was so that nobody would sneak a zucchini in the back Well, seat. now, you know what you should do now? Park your car on the street and leave all the doors open <laughs> so people right, can so give I you can zucchinis. Zucchini. Though I do have a little wee zucchini. I have a little yellow squash that's also wee. So, Edith. Yes. You know how we love to go on Facebook and go on gardening groups. And folks, if you're out there and you like to go on Facebook, check out your gardening groups because you can get a lot of good local information. Yes, you can. Well, I heard on NPR this week that gardening groups on Facebook are pretty wholesome and a great space to talk about all things plants. But Western New York Gardeners, which has over 7,000 members, was flagged this week for violating their standards. Oh, Someone asked the group about their most loved and indispensable weeding tool, and someone replied, the push-pull hoe. Yeah. And the artificial intelligence of Facebook didn't pick up on that meaning and said that we reviewed this comment and found it goes against our standards for (laughs) harassment and bullying. (laughs) Another offending comment from this group was, quote, kill them all, drown them in soapy water. Japanese beetles, right? <laughs> right. And that got flagged? Yes, wow. because it goes against their standards for harassment and bullying. Okay. All right. That's the world we live in today, Christy. I thought that was hilarious. That is hilarious. How is your garden doing, Edith? Well, it, it's doing okay. You know, it's doing okay. Um, I'll talk about my tomato problems shortly. I've been doing a lot of weeding. I've been doing a lot of between 20 and 30 Japanese beetles a day, drowning and killing them. Isn't that interesting? Not you? You know, I've had some. I haven't had 20 to 30 a day. I do. And folks, we live three blocks apart. Christy, I hung out my wash today, and I hung out this yellow towel, and a Japanese beetle flew over and sat on my towel right in front of me. That's a lot of nerve. That is a lot of nerve. I had a Japanese beetle... Um, in my hair Ooh, that I didn't realize, and I was inside the house. Oh no! Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck! Oh. And I and I like turned my head and I go, "What's that crawling in my? What is that?" And I oh. reached down and it was a Japanese beetle, and so I squished him. Ah! <sighs> Yuck! With your hand? Did you squish my him with foot? With your foot? Very yeah. good. Very good. But it is weird though that you have so many more than me. It is weird. It must be we... what I'm growing. They're usually yeah. on the grapevine. Ah, that's what they like. And where I have seen them in my yard has been on the Virginia creeper because I have a little section of Virginia creeper mm. on a fence. Mm-hmm. And isn't it satisfying though to push them into a bowl of soapy water? I hate to be cruel, but yes, it is. It really, really is. Um, last week we talked about cutting a worm in half. Uh huh. That doesn't mean you get two worms. That means you have half of a dead worm and a worm that regenerates itself. Also, the worm doesn't die. That's the good. The worm doesn't die. That's a really important thing. The worm does not die. I guess that makes sense because I remember 
dissecting worms in like junior high biology and a worm has a head and it has a tail like it doesn't have two heads right it does make sense <laughs> can you tell the head from the tail yeah I good oh good for you um and the other thing is the summer squash that you came over and planted is dead. I'm sorry, Christy. Oh. The yellow squash. It is so dead. So, everybody, so this dead. was the great idea we had last week, which is that I have four yellow squash plants, and they were p planted very close together. And I just thought, you know, what would it matter, though, if I just dug it up and ran it over to your house as fast as I could, three blocks away, and we stuck it in the hole? I did that. I dug it up, I ran it, a, we got it to a car, sped the whole way, mm -hmm. Edith, you were there mm -hmm. with a beautifully dug hole, we put it in there, and it looked like it was going to be okay. Well, it did for a few minutes, but you know, it was just too old to, to mm. bear the, you know what I mean? It just, uh, it, it, the root ball didn't hold. Oh, that's so for sure. And I thought I had a really good clump of soil with it, yeah. but as soon as I put it in into the little plastic bag yeah. I was carrying it with, it just had lost the root ball. I was also worried that when we put it in the hole that we we, have, we were having trouble stamping it down so there was a lot of oxygen yes. that was getting yes. to it. So. Oh, everything went wrong that day. We should. I'm glad we're not surgeons because <laughs> <laughs> everything just went wrong, you know? Well, now and we know about big. that. Yeah. But yeah. I guess the one bright side of it is also is that I'm not going to have, I'm only going to have 50 million yellow squash as opposed yeah. to 75 million yellow yeah, squash this year. Yeah, there you go. So. That was a nice way of getting rid of the yellow squash without feeling guilty. Let's put it that way. So, so yeah, and my little one that I planted by seed is up. You oh, said, you, good. didn't you say your zucchini was up? Yes. Your little guy? So my little yellow squash is up so too. So we have little babies. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Now the interesting experiment is, is is that can they will they bear fruit before the first frost? Yes. Well, what is it? It's almost. Let me see. They have one month, two month. Oh, they will. Oh, Christy, they will. It's like uh, nine weeks. Okay. I think they will. Okay. Well, let's see who. Let's see who has. Let's see who has a blossom first. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. So and so, tell me how is your garden going? Well, I have a lot in bloom and a lot to deadhead. I have been deadheading daisies. My echinacea's up. My black-eyed Susan's up. My trumpet vine looks beautiful. My Veronica is blooming. The pansies are now gone, which is not too bad for the end of July for pansies mm -hmm, to make mm -hmm. it this long. On the veggie update, boy, are my tomatoes doing fantastic. Oh, that's good. I've been harvesting them and actually been giving some away, Edith, if you want some. Where Have you brought any over to my house or did you just bring a big, fat, dead summer squash to my house? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that summer squash was alive, but I left it with you, Missy. Uh, huh. No, I was just, if you want to bring some with you right now. Tonight, I'll give you some, um, some tomatoes. Can I? Uh, that's that's fantastic. I need to insert here because I've never done it before, which is the zinnia that I grew in the winter sowing, just about open. One of them is just about, and I've never grown them before. Mine are just about also. Yeah, so they're going to be beautiful. I also harvested a lot of green beans. So many green beans. Uh, we've been eating green beans all week, and I think mm. what I really should do is I should blanch them and get them in the freezer because oh, yeah. they're, they're really great and all my cabbage is up and ready so I have six heads of cabbage Edith <laughs> I have a friend who has one of those crockeries for sauerkraut oh good so oh, I thought good, I would good, try good. that as an experiment I've never yeah. done sauerkraut yeah. before so I thought and I like sauerkraut so I thought I would do that um and I wanted to remind folks about when they hire somebody to do gardening work in their yard it doesn't necessarily mean they know more than you do because you know your plants and you know your yard. I hired some folks to deal with the bad limb of a tree, and as long as they were there, I thought, well, will you also trim back my spirea? This is my bridal veil spirea that's in the front yard, Edith. Mm, huge. It was huge. Yeah. Beautiful display of flowers, but it had gotten a little unruly, and so I, I was too tall for me to get to it. And let's be honest, the cleanup part is just a not very much fun. So I thought I'd, I hired them to do it. And I thought maybe I should explain to them a little bit about how, what this plant is and what it likes. And it's not one of those bushes that wants to be trimmed like it's a box elder all square. Uh -huh. It's best to be a little casual. 
Uh huh. You know, that's why I feel like I want my garden to be is like, you know, casual elegance. Well, it's not called a box spirea, is it? That's so true. Huh. It's a bridal veil, so it trims down. Yeah. So I kind of explained it to them, and these guys were kind of nodding at me, so I thought we were good, and I went inside the house. And then I came out, and they, what did they do? What's your best guess, Edith? It's square now, isn't it? It's square, <laughs> right? And flat at the top. And um, oh. and I went out to them. I said, "Hey, I thought we had this discussion about how." He goes, "Yeah, we just don't have we just don't have the tools for that. We should have brought them, but we just didn't bring them. So this is what we got." And they go, "Do you want us to do something else?" Eat it. They were cutting it with a chainsaw. Oh. oh. So I just thought, you know what, folks, you're good. I'm gonna go back in a little. I'm gonna wait a couple weeks uh-huh. to see what the bushes are want uh-huh. to tell me. All right, folks, if you hear words or terms you're not familiar with or want a good laugh, check out the Upside Down Dictionary on our website at UpsideDownTulips.com. Or you can click or clink on the link in our show notes while while you're there, sign up for our newsletter, or check out our blog posts. You can see pictures of our gardens. You can see inspirations and gardening jokes if you go to Facebook, Instagram, or Pinterest. And don't forget, we have a YouTube channel. Do you like poetry? Do you like Antelope Tuomi? Then you will love our new pot play. Enjoy! Two packets of radish seeds for my fall planting, bought and paid for. The poetry reading is about to begin. Please, take your seats. Oh no, why does this keep happening to me? I have a Zoom meeting in 30 minutes, plus so much garden work... I really can't stay. And I remind you, it's Antelope's feed and poetry, and it's mandatory. I've got to get out of here. But how to get out without anyone seeing? I know. I'll get into this wheelbarrow, cover myself with this frost blanket, and, using my hand, will pull myself to my car. My arms are too short. Dang it. I'm just going to have to rock back and forth to get this thing moving. Excuse me, you in the rocking wheelbarrow. Take your seat, please. Shoot. Well, this is embarrassing. Ah. I see it's you, the chicken poop toting woman. I apologize. Sorry, everyone. I'm ready. Now that we're all settled, let's begin. Hello, I am Antelope Tuomi, the Poet Laureate of Wyoming. Today's poem is called Who Has Not Turned Off Their Electronic Device? Oh my gourd, it's my phone! Oh, I just want to sink into a hole! Does our heroine, chicken poop toting, wheelbarrow scooching woman, sink into a deep hole of humiliation? Does Antelope recite her poem, or is her spirit broken? Stay tuned for part two. It's mandatory. So now we're going to talk about help. What's wrong with my tomatoes? Uh Uh-huh. You know, Edith, you can do everything right with your tomatoes, can't you? You can sure try to do every single thing right. You can give them six to eight hours of sun. Yep. You can water them consistently and deeply. Mm -hmm. You can mulch them really well. You can buy your seeds and your plants from a reputable nursery or grower. Yeah, you can grow them from seed yourself. And you can You can rotate them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. You can do everything right. And still, you could walk out to your yard just the next day and say, what's wrong with my tomatoes? Something happened. Yeah. Which, you know, is, is not, it, it's kind of a lesson for us. Like, we simply cannot control everything. It's a living thing, and we are not in control of everything. We're not in control of the weather. We're not in control of so many things. So doesn't it kind of teach us to be more accepting of we're not the bosses of everything? <laughs> That's great. And, you know, if people garden, 93% of people who have a vegetable garden, you know what they have in their garden, Edith? Tomatoes. They have tomatoes. Yeah. Or as we like to call them, plump things with a navel. Yes. Because that, what, tomatoes are thought to originate in Peru, and that name comes from the Aztecs. 
as what they call tomatoes, called Zytomol. Uh huh. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, no one will know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> And you can walk out to check out your plump things with a navel, and you can go, hey, what is this brown, mushy stuff at the bottom of my tomato? Christy, I swear to you, this is what happened to me yesterday, to my plum tomato. My, you know, plum tomatoes are like cherry tomatoes, but they're, they're a little plum-shaped. They're, they're long. They're longer, and they're really good, and I'm looking at it, and so many of the fruits had the brown spot at the end. I was like, oh, no. And that is called blossom end rot. It's very common. Yeah. Now, sometimes folks think this is a disease, but it isn't. No. It's a condition. Yeah. It means that your tomato is not taking in enough calcium. Mm-hmm. It, now, it's possible, though, unlikely that your soil doesn't have enough calcium. More likely is the fact that you are not watering consistently, mm-hmm. which means that when the plant does get water, it'll it'll send all the water and all the nutrients that it got from the soil to the stems and the leaves, and not the fruit. Yeah, and and you know, everybody don't don't feel bad. Like I I try not to blame myself too horribly, because you just it's just been so so hot. It's hard to have a specific regimen. This is how much water I'm going to give. You kind of have to do it with the weather, Mm -hmm. right? And it's also more common with plum tomatoes, Roma tomatoes, than they are with any other tomato. I didn't know that. Think how, because they're longer. And so you think about how those nutrients has to get all the way to the bottom of that fruit. Did you know, and I didn't know this, peppers, squash, cucumbers, melon fruits can also get that? I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, that's what I read. Well, it usually happens to the first tomatoes of the season, since that's when your plants are more under stress from the initial fruit set. And it also tends to happen more often in containers because the soil is more susceptible to the fluctuations in the amount of moisture it's getting. So what I did was everyone that I saw that had the blossom end rot, I took it and I threw those in the garbage. I didn't throw them in the compost. I just threw them in the garbage. Hopefully that, you know, I can rectify the problem, I hope. And you know what you can also do if that's a red tomato, Edith, is cut off the blossom end rot and eat it. True. But unlike you, I don't have any red tomatoes. Yeah. It won't taste as good. No. But it you won't. still it's still fine in sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Good good. Good but point, yeah, Christy. Yeah. yeah. Well, what can also happen is you can walk out onto your yard and the day before your plants were doing great and they were all full of flowers. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, all the flowers have fallen off. Oh, that's just awful. And that comes from temperature fluctuations. Oh, yeah. So tomatoes need night temperatures between 55 to 75 degrees Mm -hmm. in order to retain their flowers. And if the temperatures fall um, outside of this range, then the blossoms are going to fall off. Christy, what was the high end of that range? 75. Oh, at night, you mean? At night. Uh Uh-huh. Because I have also noticed that th- this heat that we have been in the 90s and for quite a while, that's not good. That's not conducive as well to tomato. It's little, it's it's on the hot side. It's on the hot side. It keeps them from ripening. Remember, it just happened to me last year because I planted heirlooms when I should have planted hybrids, and I didn't. <laughs> I don't know why. I did the didn't. same thing. I'm doing hybrids this year. Another reason why you can get blossom drop, folks, is because it could be insect damage or lack of water, or I love this, too much or not enough fertilizer, Mm. Mm -hmm. or a lack of pollination, or you're not getting enough sun. You need six to eight hours of sun. Mm. Now, you can't change the weather, but you can make sure the rest of the plant is strong by fertilizing and drawing pollinators by planting uh, good flowers like cosmos, things like that around there to help keep the blossoms on. Yes. Well, you know, Christy, I walked out. I have these two Amish paste Roma tomatoes, and I realized today what was wrong with one of them has two tomatoes. That's it. Two large tomatoes. The other one has tons of blossoms, huge plant, not a single tomato. And I realized what I did. It doesn't get enough light because it when the sun is hitting a certain angle, then the peach tree is between the sun and the tomato. Oh. 
it really should get over six hours. Eight is better. And this thing probably only gets four to five. It's all the way up by the house. So that was like, that was my mistake. I'm glad you're really fitting in with our brand, Edith, which is celebrating our garden mistakes. That's really great. (laughs) I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm really really working well. Um, You can go out to look at your tomatoes and go, hey, they all have cracks on them. Mm Mm-hmm. Mine don't have cracks, folks. Mine are smooth. Well, that can happen after a long dry spell because your tomatoes get thirsty and they'll take up the water really quickly, especially after a heavy rainfall, and that'll swell the fruit and then it'll cause it to crack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't control the rain, but just try to water more evenly during the growing season. And um, if you do get cracks, of course, you can still eat them. Yes. They just maybe not be as pretty, but you should harvest them sooner and eat them sooner than you would other tomatoes because you can get mold in those little cracks sooner. The tomatoes oh, will go bad yeah, sooner. Yeah, yeah. Good thinking, Christy. Very good thinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Edith, do you mm-hmm. ever go out to your garden and see that your your tomatoes look like cats? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the cat face. The cat yeah, face. That's so business. weird, isn't it? Yeah, that is really weird. And again, it's not a horrible thing. I mean, they're not pretty looking. But it's not awful. Yeah, it just means that the um, the blossom end gets rippled and bumpy and lumpy, which they call a cat face. And when tomatoes are pollinated in cool evenings, so this is if you're around 50, 55 degrees, you can get cat facing. The blossoms will fall off when the temperatures drop too low. But if the flower is pollinating before the petals drop off some stick to the developing tomato that creates lumps and bumps called oh. cat facing oh, isn't that weird oh. yeah that is weird did, hey did you know that walnut trees like black walnut english walnut that they're really bad for tomatoes i have heard that i remember when i had a black walnut and i had a black walnut not good for the tomato that it, it, it kind of kills the tomato if it's really close to that tree because of this chemical that the uh tree goes out. So if you think you absolutely cannot grow tomatoes and you've grown one close to a walnut, that could be the reason to get a container and move it. Mm -hmm. Not the tree, the plant, the tomato plant. Edith, what does it mean when you go out into your yard and you see little holes in your tomatoes? It means that it's possible that a squirrel was there. It's possible bugs are eating it, right? Yeah. What do you do? What do you do for squirrels? There's nothing you can do for I don't know. I, I yell at them. I throw <laughs> apples at them. You know, I don't know what to do about squirrels. Well, I've done this before. As I wrapped, when I see the evidence of squirrel, I wrap them in bird netting. Ah. Mm-hmm. I've also heard this said, I don't know if it's true or not, that usually when toma- when squirrels are going for tomatoes, they're thirsty. Yeah, I've so heard make that sure too. you have a I've water source, too. a clean water f- source nearby, like a bird bath or a bowl of water, and train them to go there. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, I used to use bird netting for this and that, and I don't anymore because one day I went out into my porch and I had this bird netting up so the uh, vines could cling to it, and there was a dead bird hanging from oh. it. So I'm not using that. I'm not. I'm done with PTSD. The, yeah, PTSD. You can squirrel. You can eat the yeah. tomato. I'm not doing the bird netting. Um, what are some of the What are some of the bugs and uh, little creepy crawlies that can get to your tomatoes, Edith? The whole, remember when I had when I found that tomato hornworm? Yeah, gigantic thing. They're like three inches long. Oh my gosh, it was so big, and they literally have a horn. They're kind of scary, and they can eat an entire tomato plant in one day. Yeah. There, there, I've only seen the one. Have you seen any this year? Not this year. I've seen one before. It really uh-huh. scared the crap out of me. Yeah, they are scary. You know, apparently, though, Ada, that there is a natural method to control the tomato hornworm. And it, it is a parasitic wasp that will lay their eggs on the body of the hornworm. Mm. So it looks like the, the hornworm is covered in Tic Tacs. Mm. Mm. And what will happen is that the... The wasps, the little baby larva wasps, will start to eat the hornworm alive yes. as oh they my. hatch. Mm-hmm. Also, um, they hate mar- those type of marigolds, those French marigolds. Mm-hmm. So if you plant French marigolds, these are the ones that have the certain kind of strong scent 
that'll also keep hornworms away. Well, that's a good idea. I, I, I don't want no part of that um, eating the inside out. I don't want no part of that. That's <laughs> just horror show in the garden. Here's a, if you if you find that your tomato plants when their little seedlings are just being cut off at the base, it could be that it's a cutworm, which is technically not a worm; it's a larva, and they can they come in from underground of your tomato plant. Oh, and, I know what you're talking about now. So you collar them with a, a, the tube of a toilet paper or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I am so sorry about my phone. I don't think I've ever been so embarrassed. Not even when you were caught trying to make a getaway in a creaky wheelbarrow. Okay, that was even more embarrassing. Not like I needed a reminder. Not to worry. We'll just go on as if nothing has happened. Today's poem is called Ode to a Gardener. See the working gardener. How humbly he or she waters the lovely flowers for the bumbly honey bee. Sowing the seeds in the garden he or she reveres, while others play canasta, the gardener perseveres. Through the high heat, the damp, and even the drought, when so many things can cause garden burn out, growing dime-sized potatoes and cat-faced tomatoes, or cabbage the size of a Brussels sprout, giving you but a thimble of your beloved sauerkraut. You persevere. Oh, pioneers of the garden, with earwigs in your clothes, thorny cuts, and also bruises, maybe getting lightheaded from the poop tea that one uses, and falling on your butt, oh, the neighbors you amuses. But the gardener, you persevere. Fighting the bindweed, the fungus, the powdery mildew. Things that return every year, a beclouded deja vu. Yet you, the gardener, persevere. So when a gardener offers you a homegrown zucchini, that's about as long as an opera by Vincenzo Bellini. Don't turn up your nose with a bougie Whole Foods attitude. Just think of what the gardener went through and accept with gratitude. Well, she's done it again. She's touched my heart, lifted my spirit, and given me all the feels. Thank you, Antelope. Encore! In real life, wheelbarrow scooching woman, there are very few encores. Today there shall be none. The store is closing. Go home, gardeners, poetry lovers, and those who snuck in because they needed to use the restroom. Go home and always be lovely. I know it's a long way to go to Wyoming from Denver, but dang, (laughs) that is such a good feed and poetry store that it's really worth the trip. Do do you just love like being immortalized in such a way? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Okay, back to tomatoes. Christy, once again, my tomatoes are as green as can be. Just green, 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 green. Oh, they're not turning red. They're not turning red. And I think it's the heat. It's Although the heat. yours are turning red, but you have hybrids. I have certain hybrids that one is a 4th of July tomato and one's an early girl. So they are bred for that. Yeah. But my other ones are all, and my cherries are red, but my other ones are all very green. And that's the heat. And that just means you need to be patient. patient. You, you know, have- Christy, I when, when I... Uh, So this year, for the first time, I planted from one of my old tomatoes from last year, I planted seedlings. I started my own seeds. And I had three black crim, two of them big and beautiful, and the third never thrived, not once. It never got higher than six inches, and then it just withered away. And that is my way of saying, you, you, I I didn't do anything wrong with it. That's the way it goes. It's and nature. I, it, Darwinism. It's just nature. And then I thought, you know what? In that exact place, three or four years ago, the same exact thing happened to my tomato. So maybe I didn't rotate. I Maybe I should have rotated way out of there. Rotating is really good. Yeah, I think that's what it was. And I'll say about 
tomatoes turning green is that the optimum temperature for ripening tomatoes is 70 to 75 degrees. Oh, my gosh. So when temperatures exceed 80 to, 85 to 90, wow. it slows it down or could even stop it. Um, wow. At those temperatures, the lycopene and the carotene, which are pigments responsible for giving their fruit their typical appearance, can't be produced. So they'll just stay in mature green phase for quite some time. And and if you can't wait, you could always, once they're yeah. starting to turn just a little bit, when they start turning a little bit, you can bring them inside yeah. and put them in a dark area so that you can use the ga- the ethylene gas yeah. to turn it. But, um, you know, putting it in sun won't help. You'll just get sun scald. Your tomatoes will get mm-hmm. sunburn if mm-hmm. you do that. Removing all the leaves won't help because no. then you'll get sun scald from that. Let's talk about the virus, the fungus that are in the soil, which is what I think happened to my little tiny tomato. They're just they're just in the soil. And what you did was, like, you moved your tomato town this year. Yes. You garden on a grid. And you moved it away from what, what killed some of those tomatoes last year, right? Yes. And this year, you only lost one tomato. That's correct. And it was an heirloom. Is that right? It was um, an heirloom? I don't know if it was an heirloom or not. I can't remember, but it wasn't, it was the Roma and it wasn't protected against, it wasn't, didn't have like the verticillium wilt or those protections against it. There's a lot of fungus that will cause your tomato plants to all of a sudden turn yellow Mm -hmm. or brown or start to wilt. Yeah. And um, prevention is always the best key, which is to make sure that you're watering consistently. You're watering the toes and never the nose. Mm Mm-hmm. And that you mulch a lot. Yeah, and don't mulch right up to the very stem of it. But you want to mulch so that if it rains, for example, and there's fungus, it doesn't splash up into the lower leaves. So another good idea is to cut off the the bottom four to six inches of leaves so that the tomato so it won't get splashed mm-hmm. up into. The most common is going to be early blight. Mm-hmm. And you'll know you have it if you see... Um, the lower leaves start to break out in yellow spots. And usually within within that, um, they'll start to have rings like a target. That fungus can live in the soil over winter. So if your plants have a problem with this, you've planted tomatoes in the same exact spot, chances are good that you'll happen to you again. So if you get that, it's best to take those tomatoes and put them in the garbage, yeah. not on the compost pile, and rotate your crops but you can also just pull the lower leaves off mm-hmm. and just kind of chase them, chase them around. Yeah, yeah. And, and don't, don't spread. Feel, don't feel bad if it doesn't work because, like, like you said, prevention is like one of the biggest, best things yeah. you can do. Once it really gets a hold of a plant, it's really Get rid hard of it. to stop it. That's the yeah. mistake I made last year with my Alice tomato plant, uh-huh. Edith, is I just couldn't rip it out. I don't know what my problem was, but I should. I, I was a bit more brutal with Cindy Brady this year. Uh huh. Yeah. And as soon as I went, oh no, 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 we are not doing this again, and yeah. into the garbage that she went. Well, let's talk about pre- in terms of preventing, and you you talked about this earlier. What is the um, um, the resistant? When you get a hybrid that is resistant, you will see on the seed tag, like VFN, mm-hmm. right, which means it's resistant to ver. How do you say verticillium wilt? Verticillium. Verticillium wilt. It's resistant to fusarium, and it has nematode resistance. Now, that doesn't say it's a guarantee, but it's re- so much better than leaving yeah. your poor thing defenseless. It's a good point. It's not a guarantee because I do have some yellowing of some of mm-hmm. my tomato plants. And what mm-hmm. I do is I go every couple of days, I go out there and I just nip those off and I mm-hmm. put them in the garbage. Yeah. Make sure you wash your hands. Clean your tools off. Yes. Yes, definitely. Because that thing spreads like crazy. Yeah. And that's also true for like uh, septoria, which is also a yellowing of the plant. It's really kind of hard to know if you have like early blight or if you have septoria or if you have verticillium wilt without really going to your county extension office. So I would just take it off um, and remove it and just know Mm -hmm. that it's some kind of fungus in your soil. Now, there is a fungus that is airborne. That doesn't live in your soil, and that's the worst one of them all. Oh. And that's um, that's when you go out and you just see brown blotches on your tomato leaves and on your stems and then on the fruit, and eventually the whole plant will just wilt and collapse. I've had that happen. That's called that. late blight. 
yeah. also affects potatoes, which are related to tomatoes. And that's just a death sentence. You just have to remove and destroy the infected plant as soon as you see any sign of it. And um, it's rarely a problem with indoor tomatoes, but it, it's it's airborne, so it'll f just float on the air. So just even if you do everything right, you can still get late blight. It's an also a good idea not to plant your tomatoes too close together because if they were to get, the fungus can jump plant to plant. Mm -hmm. all, all they have to do is touch, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always easy to underestimate how big your tomato is yeah. going to get. That's a really good point too. I'm always, I always guess wrong. Me, me too. In fact, I was out there today cutting off some of the huge, gigantic branches on the on the bottom of the plant that were touching the next guy. I have to have you come out to my vegetable garden, Edith, and help me with pruning. Okay. Because I get so nervous about it. And I know it's important, mm -hmm. but you want to make sure that plants have a lot of good circulation because that yes. can help with the fungus also. Make sure your plant is well, but you don't want to cut off too much, otherwise you'll get sun scald. That's right. And you want the inside, you want the sun to be able to reach inside as well. So, yeah, I will. I will. I would love to help you with that. I, I enjoy doing stuff like that. And to me, I look at all these things that can happen to a tomato, and it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all because the reward is so wonderful. Yeah. The reward of a vegetable gardener is the tomato. It's the caprese salad and the homemade sauce and the tomatoes that you just, you little cherry tomatoes you just pop in your mouth when you're out in the garden. It's telling somebody, here's a tomato, I grew this. Yeah. They are so delicious and so wonderful. It's a little bit like roses. Like roses can have quite a few little things happen to them, mm -hmm. but as long as you know what they are and you can get your get ahead of them, it's not that bad because the payoff yeah. of a tomato in the garden to me is worth it, every you know, bit. It is easy to get frustrated, but look look at the long game. Look at the fact that make a note of what variety of tomato you bought. You may not buy a variety that is all that conducive to either your soil or your zone. So if that doesn't work, try something else next year. Yeah, that's year. kind of fun. Don't be like me and do the same thing every year. <laughs> and Shake it up a bit. Yeah, shake it up until you find what really works yeah. for you. And perfectionism is just going to make you sad in the garden. Yeah. yeah. As we like to say, good is not the enemy of perfect. It's okay to have a little chewing. It's okay to have a little bugs. It's okay to have yes. a little yellow leaf happening. It because is. Because I tell you this, Edith, I have some beefsteak tomatoes that are size of baseballs right now that are going to turn red in a couple of weeks uh -huh. and that's going to be incredible you're going to be so happy <laughs> oh my gosh i didn't even say the best part about tomatoes blts yeah that's a really i'm <sighs> bacon <laughs> excuse me i'm just going to check here the mailbox and see if there's anything in here is there Guess what time it is, Edith? Is it mailbag time? It's mailbag. Okay, ring, ring. Okay, well, this week, um, our letter comes from Lisa from Denver. And she says, Edith and Christy, I thought you might be interested in the petition below since you talked about this on your podcast. She is referring to episode 27 and 28 from the ground up and starting your own seeds. And this is about the bill in Congress that would impose strict rules on baby food manufacturers and require regular testing to verify levels of toxic metals. Remember we talked about this? And like the arsenic is like 900 times more than you can get in water. They and found this in baby food, baby food in our country. Oh, yeah. And in Europe, they, have the, they at least have some rules in Europe that, that make sense and don't kill babies. But apparently here, <laughs> we haven't gotten around to that yet, but there is a bill in Congress right now. And um, Lisa says, please, to support this, tell the members of Congress, your members, to support the Baby Food Safety Act of 2021. Um, and here's something that's going to speed it along, Christy. Remember when we talked about the um, the Roundup? And the $2 billion settlement that went to one couple, the lawyers for that were Baum Helland, was, is, their, is their name. They are bringing a lawsuit against all of these baby food companies. And they, what they have done is they are making an association between the heavy metals in baby food and autism and ADHD. 
Oh my goodness. Yes. And they're doing that thing where they look for people. If mm-hmm. your kid has eaten this mm-hmm. let us and has autism, you know, let us know. So I think in light of that, here's a couple of things that have happened in light of that. Beach Nut on June 8th, just last month, uh, two months ago, issued a voluntary baby food recall for its infant rice cereal because of the arsenic levels. In fact, it would really be a good idea, everybody out there, if you have little kids that eat baby food, don't feed them rice. There, th- right now, there is no way to get that level down. Just don't do it until they figure out how to get the arsenic out of the soil. And can I just add on to that, Edith, that you have some great recipes on our website for how to make your own baby food. Mm-hmm. And, it, and hopefully you're doing it out of the fruits and vegetables you grow from your own backyard. And that doesn't mean that your backyard is necessarily free of heavy metals either. If you want to be absolutely positive, you got to get, you got to build a raised bed and you got to fill it with organic soil that actually says on it that doesn't have any heavy metals. Because if you have a house, in 1978 is when they said you cannot do leaded paint. Mm. Well, my house is from 1930. So you know that the paint at one point was leaded. And this affects children and babies so much more than it does for grown-ups. Yeah, because they're so little, teeny, tiny. So all of this stuff, like leaded gas, all, all the stuff, the emissions, went into our soil. This is why it's better to do stuff in the backyard, not the front yard, not where it's all really, really busy. So anyway, folks, please, please, before that comes up for a vote... Tell your member of Congress to support the Baby Food Safety Act of 2021. And thank you, Lisa, for bringing this back around thank to you, our Lisa. attention. How can people sign the petition if they want to? Where do they go for that? I think if they went to the Baby Food Safety Act, if you Google that, I think that you could, um, you would find that petition. Thanks, Lisa. So. Thank you. And folks, if you have your favorite gardening stories, successes, flops you want to tell us what's going on with your tomatoes will you please write to us we wish that you would just do this it's at upside down tulips at gmail or at our website at upside down tulips.com you can also check out the show notes christy the light is soft the feeling is misty you look moved can you can you share with us what moved you so here is this week's inspiration edith It's by Lewis Grizzard, American writer and humorist. It's difficult to think anything but pleasant thoughts while eating a homegrown tomato. Oh, oh, that's very nice. That's a good one, Christy. Okay, everybody, thank you for listening. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. Did you get some laughs, some value out of our This Tomato episode? If so, could you do us a favor? Just hit that subscribe, like, or follow button on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We want to thank Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Tulips, the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you'd like to hear more of Denise's music, go to denisegentilini.com, or you can find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. Yay! Hey, join us next week. We have water-saving tips for your garden. Don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down.